Thank you, Andrew. And thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Leiden. The dangerous idea, I think, in this session is very simply that knowledge is not proprietary, with the strong implication that this phrase, intellectual property, may be an oxymoron. Um, uh, we know, in, in truth, that the commodification and the copywriting of ideas and information is a huge growth industry, especially in the digital age. And there's a tremendous irony there. John Perry Barlow once said to me on the radio, uh, the internet is really basically one huge cosmic copying machine. It will do for intellectual property what Xerox did for government secrecy. And yet we have, you know, th th there's a giant conflict here, and we're sort of testing it out in the classroom. The open source idea, before it was a radio show, was very simply the notion, not very simply, the notion out of the computer industry that users and customers make the product better by changing it and passing on the improvement. In journalism, the open source idea is that the readers of the New York Times know vastly more than the writers and the editors of the New York Times, and that somehow that wisdom has got to be funneled up. In architecture, it's the notion that the arch, the column, are universal, common ideas. In music, it's the idea that 4-4 four, four time is nobody's property. Even John Coltrane's improvisations become part of a language that we all use and adapt. I mean, not all of us, but the question this hour is, what's happening in the classroom where we know kids teach each other, fundamentally, and yet the textbook industry thinks it owns the world? Andrew, I wish you'd just begin in the heart of real New York today. What actually is this confrontation all about? Outline it. Okay, well, thank you. That's what I want to try to do and maybe change some people's assumptions about education technology in the 21st century. I want to just quickly ask everyone to raise their hands if they think that the digital divide is, is uh, better or worse. Do you think it's better, meaning that more people are connected than in, in, in public schools and in education than it was 10 years ago? Raise your hands. Okay, so it's a majority of you. Well, let me give you a couple of quick data points. The average student in a New York City public school spends one hour a week using a computer. The average student in New York City Public Schools family has to pay $30 to $40 a month for broadband, which is $500 a year, out of the reach of most working class families. There was no broadband 10 years ago. <laughs> to give you an idea of what kind of disconnect we have, the mayor of New York, our technologist Michael Bloomberg, as some like to call him, just banned cell phones from New York City public schools. And to set the context for this discussion, I want to quickly just, if I can get the uh, slides up, I want to just try to challenge some assumptions and offer some dangerous ideas. Could we get the slides up? <laughs> okay. Maybe we don't need slides. So, okay, so, it's, so the first one is, is that the classroom is not, oh, there we go. Seven education errors. I was inspired by Kwame Anthony this morning about errors and decided to do it this way. So the first one is that classroom, classrooms are the primary delivery device. Schools are only open 15% of all the time in the year. Think about that. The teachers are the people that we look to to deliver education. that students are products as opposed to partners, that the stakeholders shouldn't, don't need to be connected the same way as every Fortune 500 company has connected its employees, its customers, and its suppliers in the last five years alone. This is a challenging one, that words and texts have a monopoly on literacy. Oh, and the testing will tell us what is happening and who is succeeding. But here's the one that I like the best. The technology will solve the above. And so the reason why we're here today is really to listen to the people who are at the forefront of this battle, which frankly, 
as we've been listening and shocked at, the, uh, at some of the things we're hearing in regards to global warming and the challenges facing us in the 21st century, to reboot our education system to match the challenges is as big and as shocking a problem. So thank you. We'll be back. <laughs> B Bobby, what is Kariki? Kariki is a new organization just Oh, a new organization just recently funded um, by Scott McNeely, the founder of Sun, along with the other founders of Sun. And we are, our mission is to create curriculum using the community in an open source manner. Scott likes to say that uh, as Al Gore created the internet, he created open source. I don't think it's quite that good, but he can believe it. But we're here to make, this is a big idea, and there are three challenges here, um, three dangerous ideas. One, can you trust the community to educate? Two, can you build education collaboratively? Think about that one. And three, can you f deal with the issue of creating open source with the sustained community that's out there of the publishers, of the teachers unions, of the established schoolhouse, of the frameworks and standards of the No Child Left Behind Act. So these are dangerous ideas, and if this truly will work, how will we answer those questions? Give, give us a, an answer to one, just for the okay. starters. Well, I think that the, the major answer that we're going to create is a place for people globally to go to have universal access to education. And to do that, we have two problems. One, how do you build critical mass of curriculum, not just critical mass of content? Content is not what you can use standalone in the classroom. And two... Bobby, could I interrupt? I'm always thinking about what, what would it be like if the readers of the New York Times could write it, could feed back information. Here's what's actually going on in Ulaanbaatar. How could kids, how could the users, consumers, the co-conspirators in the classroom actually make the curriculum. That's the really. other side of the question. How do you build a critical mass of people to contribute on the community side? And we're doing that in a variety of ways. One, we're identifying community, including working with the uh, Association of Retired Teachers. And second, we're building a new platform at curriculum.org that will use collaborative technology to be able to build curriculum and open source textbooks. And that platform will, in, will involve the use of tools that have never been out there before in the collaborative community. We're going to have to come back. Mark, you're a physicist rewriting science text for South Africa. Is this an open source idea? Is this philanthropy? Is this guilt? What, what's going on here? <laughs> well, um, so my, my short story is, uh, as a graduate student at the University of Cape Town, I got roped into going to a science festival and after demonstrating to kids from schools all over the country uh, just the basic properties of waves, uh, a bunch of kids from a rural school had clubbed together collaboratively to uh, raise enough money to buy a blank notebook and a pen. And they'd come to me and asked me to write down everything I taught them about waves. And I was just, you know, wavelength, amplitude, no nothing complicated. Um, but they didn't have any textbooks. They said that their teacher wasn't able to explain anything. And um, so we decided, uh, myself and a bunch of the other graduate students, um, late on a Friday night for some reason, that we, we, could do, we could do the textbook a couple of weekends, you know, pack, each, you know, pack us all into a room, order a lot of pizza, we'll sit down, we'll just write it, we'll crank it out. It's, it's high school physics, it's not that complicated. But um, so that, it took much longer. We're now editing four years later only. But, um, so that's sort of where it got started, but the, um, the bottom line is ultimately that if you free the content of the editors, authors, and publishers' royalties, we can print hardcover books for less than $3 a book, which cover three grades of content. And so we've been working uh, purely as a nonprofit, basically without any funding, actually. Um, we used the Savannah GNU platform as our, as our resource. Um, to maintain, so you change the server. economics, do you change the content, do you change the effectiveness, do you think, or not? Um, well, I think the important thing is that the, the real message is that um, the, the average person can support and influence education. You know, the idea is out there that there are these massive bureaucracies in place, these structures exist, and you can't do anything about it. You can. You just have to spend some time. And people can do it from their own home. They can make a significant contribution to education. And in South Africa, the, I mean, I guess it's like this in the U.S., I don't really know, but, you know, the publishers sit down with the government and, and the Department of Education, and they make the plan, yet there are kids without textbooks. 
Carrie, you're making a significant contribution in Brooklyn. How do you do it? I'm going to tell you two stories about that. Um, one is I'm going to give you a picture of what a technology-infused classroom looks like to contrast what was said over here by Andrew in that some of our students only have access what were the hours again, Andrew? One hour a week. One hour a week. OK, so an, a technology-infused classroom in my school, which is a, a privileged environment. Um, I have a fourth grade class. They're working on a river study. They're learning about waterways, where water comes from, what it makes. They draw pictures of this after they define their words. They come and see me for computer class. And a child says, I don't remember what a Ford looks like. So I turn around to my computer, and I go to Google, and I look up Ford, and I pull up pictures on a smart board, and I go through, and I say, which one of these to you looks like a Ford? They go, I don't think that's right. We go back to the computer. This is happening live right now. It's not a textbook. It's the internet. We're using the resources that are available to us. And in my school, that happens all the time because we're connected in every classroom all the time. We're also using media to examine our place in the world. We're creating media. We're dissecting media. That only happens in a technology-rich environment. I could never do what I do in one hour a week. It just wouldn't happen. Hmm. Is that one story or two? That's kind of both. <laughs> Uh, you, you get, you get a bonus fast. one. You were very quick on the two. <laughs> the, the Talk about filmmaking. One of the recent projects that we've done, which I, I'm very proud of, is um, I work in a Quaker school, and with all the things that happened in New York City um, in the past couple of years, we were talking a lot about identity, religion, ethnicity, and uh, we did a documentary film that involved two production crews, one at Brooklyn Friends in Brooklyn, New York, one at Ramallah Boys and Girls Friends School in Ramallah, Palestine, to talk about the experiences of Muslim students inside of a Quaker school. The students at Brooklyn Friends produced their half of the documentary in Brooklyn, New York. Then two adults, because we couldn't take students at the time, two adults, myself and my, um, another colleague, went to Ramallah, Palestine. We spent seven days there. In those seven days, we brought all the equipment because they didn't have it. We brought, our literally, our backpacks, our laptops, our cameras inside backpacks. We arrived. On the first day we arrived, we taught them how to use the equipment and began the process of the documentary. In the seven days we were there, they created their half. They began to edit their half. We brought it back and wrapped it all together. This is being used now in Quaker schools to talk about these issues of core identity. We couldn't do this if we couldn't create the media. The students involved in creating the media were able to, to hear things in a different way. They respect things in a different way, because it's another 16-year-old saying, this is what I believe, this is what I do. It's another 15-year-old manipulating the media. Ah, and it teaches them so much about what mother culture and the world is telling them as they're consuming media at the same time. They're much more critical of their environment because of what we do. Fascinating. David Wiley, what's the, what is the theory of a bottom-up uh, open source education? I, I'm still not quite clear. Well, there are at least two components to education, right? One is the, the materials and the curriculum, the structure of the materials, and then the other is the support that's provided around those. So the saying goes that if humans weren't important in education, libraries would never have evolved into universities, right? So hmm. producing a bunch of educational materials using an open source methodology is important and is a first step. Um, but you get some materials put out there, something like the MIT OpenCourseWare, and a student's going through and watching videos of an award-winning professor at MIT teaching about linear algebra. But at some point, you just say, I, I have no idea what, what just happened. You know, I thought I was following it. If you never had this experience in math, you didn't take enough math. Right? <laughs> I thought I was following what he was saying, and then he wrote A instead of X. Now, did I, did I not get it? Or did he make a mistake, just absentmindedly on the board? What happened there? Who, who do I ask? All right, so there has to be the kind of equivalent of technical support. There has to be this instructional support. Somebody that you can call, somebody you can email, get on a discussion board. And that's not going to be a faculty member. It's not going to be somebody with a PhD. It's going to be the community, again, in an open and free way, answering each other's questions. I understood this part of it. You understood the other. Between the two of us, maybe we can get each other's questions answered. OK, that's using the technology to make connections with authorities or explainers. I'm, in my world, when we think of open source radio, we're thinking of tapping bloggers' voices. There are now 30, 40, 50 million original, expressive people out there who've never been heard from before, and we try to bring them in. How does, particularly at an elementary level, early level, or intermediate level, uh, the open source idea work of people other than experts contributing to the body of what we're learning, or the definition of what's to be learned? Uh, I think one part of that, and this has been mentioned a number of times already, is that things change so quickly. Um, so that by the time 
you come out, you graduate from high school, you come into your undergraduate, you do some kind of teacher ed program, you get out into the schools, the technology that you knew is just not even relevant anymore, mm -hmm. right? You came out in 95, you came out in 2000, this is pre-blogs, pre-YouTube, pre-iPod, pre-everything that students are immersed in now. And who, who does the teacher rely on right. to get that material across? Did they just skip it? Do they leave it out? Do they not leverage that in the classroom? Because the vast majority of them don't have those skills. And so one way, particularly the younger ones, to engage them is to get them involved in technical support, the kinds of things that Andrew's talking about, have them producing their own media, the kind of things Carrie's talking about. Okay. General question for everybody. I, I have a grandchild now with lightning thumbs when it comes to uh, you know, in, in messaging and text, this sort of thing. With a, with a technology-saturated generation, what is the, how is the definition of literacy and of knowledge and of usable, the kinds of skills we're supposed to learn in school changing? Please, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on that one. Um, something that's been batted around but hasn't been talked about a lot here is something called information and media literacy. And when I talk about creating media with students, helping them to dissect media that they're absorbing all of the time, it helps them be not only more critical about their world, but think about becoming content creators. You talk about your grandchild yes. and the lightning fast thumbs. Yes. All of, most students, by the time they reach my class in fourth grade, already have an email address, have already created some sort of content, already collaborating in some sort of social network online somewhere. The generation that is here, um, and has been here for quite some time, I think we're just now identifying it, is a whole generation of digital natives. Um, the rest of us, in some ways, are digital immigrants. This is the world they were born into. We all get those emails that go around. If you were born in 19, fill in the blank, um, the cell phone wasn't here, the answering machine wasn't here, we talk about these technologies. These are the tools of their generation. If we don't start to leverage these in the classroom, there's a disconnect that's happening and some of the things that Bobby's trying to do and that Mark is doing with free textbooks and Andrew is doing by empowering students. If we don't do this, the whirlpool that is public education that is, that is not preparing our students for this the flat world that Tom Friedman talked about, our kids will not be competitive. And then it has all sorts of geopolitical, socioeconomic implications for the future of our country. This is, it is this important that we yeah, do this. Can I be so bold as to say, what are they missing? And do we have to worry about that, the things that they're not this learning? Is, this is a bigger, I mean, this is while it's very nice to know that we're, you know, going to teach kids media, media literacy, we're going to teach them X, Y, or Z. This is a bigger question than that. The question is how, where we've got to look at education in a completely different light or it's not going to change. So the fact that we, they're now bringing an iPod into the classroom or telephone, unless we look at the structure of education and the people that decide what our kids are going to learn and how they're going to learn it and where they're going to learn it, we're not going to change education. And open sourcing has changed the way we think about developing code. How many of you use open office or how many of you use Linux or how many of you think about what those particular projects have done for the rest of the world and changing the way of access to the computer? If we think of those benefits of open source and we apply that to education, then whether then creating literacy and creating universal access and the kind of things that Mark's doing and the kind of things that David's teaching his graduate students, we're going to look out of the box here. And that's a dangerous idea. Because when I meet with Marjorie Scardina's group at Pearson, or I meet with the Holt people, or I meet with Reed Elsevier, and I tell them that I want them to give me their content from the old books that are sitting on the bookshelves so that I can use that as to germinate open source textbooks, their first reaction is to say, you want what? And then, after I go in and explain to them that this is an opportunity for them to, one, reach markets that they couldn't reach before, two, create access, universal access, and they can be the distributor, distrib distribution model, they begin to think that maybe there is an economic model here where they can change education and do well and do good. So we're thinking about open source in a much larger way to change education. And people like Mark and Terry and Carrie, that they put it in their classrooms, they're using it because they're way ahead in that thinking. But unless we have a larger movement that's going to change this, as Kariki and Scott's vision for this is, we're not going to change it just because we put a few open source courses up at MIT. To, to just, just quickly add, to connect the dots there, the open, sor the open source opportunity is terrific. But if you're not connected, you can't join the open source revolution. And, and just, a, just another quick data point, teachers who might be curious about the open source revolution, 
the average teacher in New York City gets one hour of paid professional development a year. This is a massive crisis. And I couldn't agree with Kerry Moore that we have to get out of our romanticized notion of what education is, the kids carrying the textbooks on their way to school, in class, enjoying themselves with the teacher at the front of the class imparting the wisdom of the world and get with the program because the world's changing and we better do it fast or we're screwed. Can I just say, there's a total disconnect between what you're saying and almost all the journalistic commentary on education that I see, which is invariably about which town is doing better or worse on standardized tests than they did a year ago or than the other town. We're talking standards, we're talking uh, testing, testing, testing numbers. We don't hear anything like what you're saying in, even on public radio, shall we say, about... Well, I think the No Child Left Behind Act has just completely stopped innovation in education. Because with... We <laughs> <laughs> and before I became the executive director of Curriki, I know last night there was a wonderful three-minute piece on being a venture capitalist, but that's what I was. I was a venture capitalist investing in education technology companies. And when I first began to look at this, I realized that I, as a venture capitalist, wouldn't invest in any new innovative education company because they weren't going to succeed because of the No Child Left Behind Act. So we've completely eliminated innovation. I think open source allows us, for, for, and this is the economic reason again, open source allows us to be able to, to bypass the rules that are driving the No Child Left Behind Act. Because if we can open source textbooks and we can open source curriculum, we don't have to go through an adoption procedure because the taxpayers aren't paying for it. Can I just say, Bobby, though, it's not just uh, No Child Left Behind. It's MCAS, it's standardization, it's, there's a drive, there's a insecurity, a need, a fear wrapped up around public education. Where do you confront it? How, what do we do about it? David. Um, I think for a long time we've been trying to confront it head on. We've been trying to confront it with policy. We've seen smarter policies. We've seen stupider policies. <laughs> we've seen more of the stupider. Um, I, I think one of the most dangerous ideas about open education is this that when you provide this open access and you put it online and you make it digitally available so a hundred people, a million people can access it at the same time, we do things to benefit our own students here in the U.S. But open means open, hmm. right? There's a huge hunger in China, there's a huge hunger in India for engineering curriculum, for computer science, for these kinds of things. It may be that the only way to really drive change in education in the U.S. is to open source what we do, feed that into some of our competitors and then have this notion of national competitiveness drive change to catch up, right? <laughs> okay, do you see where I'm coming from? Yes, uh, yes, a, a yes. Few, a few, the, the Secretary of Education has a, had a commission on the future of higher ed, which I got to go testify to to talk about openness. Um, I gave a talk there, went over like a lead balloon. I got invited to come to China and talk at about 10 different universities to give that same talk. I got invited to Europe to give that same talk a number of times. Everybody outside the U.S. gets the power of this, and they're hungry for it, and they're desperate for it, and we seem to be happy with the way things are working. And it may be that the best thing we can do to drive change is to be open, facilitate these things happening in other places, and then use that to drive change here. To catch up. Kerry. I have a dangerous idea. And the dangerous idea is that if we open up education, in this country in particular, it will fundamentally change access to knowledge, which will change the base of power. And I think that's one of the reasons we have to fight through bureaucracies, as Bobby said, okay, to get the textbooks in, we can circumnavigate the adoption process. All right, that, that's one way. What Andrew's doing is empowering the students in high schools to take control so they can be connected, so they can, they can get the knowledge that they need. But by keeping people disconnected, keeps them away from the knowledge, keeps them away from the power, keeps them away from the currency of the current century, which is information. Mm. And so the dangerous idea is that if we open it, if the United States opens it, knowing, think about all we've heard in the past 48 hours, knowing what we know about the geopolitical landscape, knowing what we know about what's going on in the shift, the shift around the world, knowing that the world is flat, if we open this up, if the United States cracks that nut, what does that mean for us? Knowing that we're not giving our kids the skills that they're gonna need to compete in the global marketplace. That is a fundamental change in power. 
And I think part of it, like someone said earlier on the conversation about faith, it's not about the veil, it's about the fear of what that represents. I'm a little confused here because the Chinese are chasing us and they're sending their best and brightest to our universities to play a more open game that you think has got to get ahead of us before we'll be motivated to get our early education act together. Is that the... Well, if you look at the uptake of these open education projects at universities, there are currently about 400 universities around the world that have open access projects like the one at MIT, the open courseware. Right. There's actually a formal consortium of those schools, and we all get together twice a year. There are about 10 of them in the United States out of the 400. There's about 250 in China. There's 10 in Japan. There's 10 in France. There, the uptake is huge in a variety of other places, and for some reason we don't, we can't seem to get it. In 2004, incoming freshman MIT said that the existence of this open courseware project um, played a significant or very significant role in their deciding to choose to come to MIT. 8% of the students coming in said that. In 2005, it was 34% of the students. Okay, so we think about MIT as the kind of place that has their pick of whoever they want. Right. right? But th this openness as a platform for all kinds of pedagogic innovation to happen on is something that the best and brightest are starting to make their decisions based on. It's one of the criteria that they consider when they choose where to go. We have 10 universities in the US making these kind of commitments now. There are 200 in China making it now. We, we, as a matter of national policy, particularly in higher ed, now I'm not, a, I'm not a K-12 person per se, but in higher ed, we have to wake up and get this. And we have to drive this idea of what is essentially peer review right, into education. Now, just to go on for one more second. What drives quality in research is this notion of peer review, right? I right. do some research, I send in some people look at it. Teaching does not work that way. But right? When I go into say. the classroom, I close the door and it's all bets are off and whatever I do is what I do. If I have to be open and transparent and accountable for what I do in the classroom, then so teaching becomes exposed to all the same machinations of peer okay, review and it drives quality. Let's just throw in another paradox here and it's the peer review point that, that triggers it in my head. Peer review is the reign of the professionals, the reign of the union in a certain sense. Uh, it's part of the culture now that we flatter everybody else. We flatter amateurism. You know, amateurs built the canoe, professionals built the Titanic, that, that kind of thinking. And it goes along with a culture that at some level also wants to flatter the children, wants to say, well, of course they're smarter than we are on technology, so they must be smarter than we are on everything. Is it true in education? Do we really believe that the kids can lead the way, as I believe the readers of the New York Times could lead the editors of the New York Times if they had the chance? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think, Christopher, I think that the bigger issue is, is what kind of policies are we, are we creating in our country that um, prevent innovation, prevent experimentation? Um, do, the, to answer your question specifically, do all the fifth grade history teachers in the United States in total know more than a fifth grade history book? Clearly, yes. So, if they were connected to each other and collaborating, Amen. we would be able to take advantage of that. Right. And, and, if a, and if a student along the way discovered a bug in the software, <laughs> he could point it out. But our politicians, as a converse to show they don't know the difference, and I said this, it's shocking to me, I said this two years ago when I spoke here, and I can't believe I'm still saying it today. Politicians don't know the difference between a server and a waiter. I'll be your server this hour, Andrew. Also, I think that education in the U.S. is a push. It goes to what David's saying. We need to market differently open source to the educators in America. We have to, as you say, flatter them and suggest that they have a lot of good things that they could push out there into the open source market that the rest of the world will pull. Okay, get ready. It's your, going to be your turn in a moment as, as soon as Carrie speaks. To I want to split hairs here in a, a little bit. Um, do I believe that the fifth graders in the world can lead their way through their curriculum by themselves? No. I think they need a guide. I think they need an adult there to help push them and guide them and, and sort of keep them on track. We're going from here, to, from A to B. But how we get there is a creation of all of us together. It is not me giving you the knowledge, it is us on a journey together. And in that journey is where the innovation comes. That's where the students are partners in their own, in their own education process. 
But it's the biggest fear, just quickly, the sure. community, building the community that yeah. works as you need it to work. Everybody yeah. says, you know, you there are idiots out there and they're going to influence things. And so you tie it all, you, you close it all off and you don't let anybody in and you don't let anybody think. And you have to, you have to take that leap and accept that the community, you can construct a community around it. This is when we take the leap. This is the moment in talk radio where we go to the phones or to the bloggers on open source. <laughs> uh, questions? Objections, new subjects, please. In the, in the front. Well, I, I've lived all over the United States and I've been involved in a number of different communities and a lot of communities are doing lots of wonderful things with technology and they've been willing to tax themselves to pay for it. So in New York, why aren't people willing to tax themselves to pay for these things? <laughs> Let me, uh, let me ask a follow-on question. I've also seen the incredible bureaucracy in the public schools where there's terrific teachers, there's ordinary teachers, and the terrific teachers won't force the ordinary teachers to perform. And they're willing to get by with, you know, terrible mediocrity. You know, I, for one, am not sympathetic at all because I don't see the communities doing anything to help themselves. Hmm. Th that's actually not complete. I mean, in New York City, as a matter of fact, a coalition of parents and teachers got together and sued New York State and got a ruling for $2 billion to be pumped into the New York City public school system. Unfortunately, it's been tied up in appeals and it hasn't come through, but there are parents who are trying to get more money. The problem is, is that for too long we have been told that public education is a failure and it needs to be, the only way to succeed is for it to be competed with, with charter schools or with vouchers. That's true, but the people who are succeeding need to be supported and highlighted and models of their work needs to be expanded. And we need to drive the open source community to drive the community that's not within the bureaucracy to participate from without, from without side. And, and just a comment that Carrie just made, I disagree that we need a teacher always in the classroom. We've been commented by, co contacted by the Minister of Education in India to build for them 365 science activities for middle school open source. 1.4 million teachers don't show up every day in the schools in India because they have double jobs and they have absenteeism at both jobs. It's the only way they can afford to survive. So they want to know when they send that 11th grader into the fourth grade class that all they have to do is go to the open source curriculum to hand out something. So the community has to be part of this, the new community, not the internal community. Please up on that, um, the, uh, there's a lot of infra infrastructure costs. Uh, Stand up, please. Oh, I couldn't Sorry. see you. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure costs, obviously, in education, and that's a huge part of the local tax dollar at work, if you will. Um, I work in a library where we serve a lot of homeschoolers, and one of the homeschool mothers was telling me that Pennsylvania is now creating many charter schools at home and giving the parents laptops who are willing to be homeschooled parents, and of course they have to be, uh, go through whatever test process the uh, school requires. But do you see a place for you know, moving some of that money away from bricks and mortar and putting it into, if you will, distributed educational opportunities? Uh, absolutely. I mean, this, is, this Blackberry and this cell phone is my office. I don't have a physical office anymore. And my computer that's sitting someplace in, in my bag there is the way I, I, I do most of my work. And I don't really care whether it's a Mac or a PC. It, it, um, it, it's really the technology, we should be agnostic about the technology. The issue is that we have an opportunity to connect all the stakeholders. And if we connect all the stakeholders, then we can figure out where we need to put the resources for any hard physical spaces. But, the, but we have to get out of the notion of building boxes and putting kids into them where and I can tell you this is a fact, you'll have schools in this country where you'll have a school on one side of the street and a senior center on the other side of the street and the people who live at, work in those, or in those buildings never see each other. Hmm. Something's wrong with that paradigm. In, in the balcony, number three. Hi, Peter Duran, AlphaChamp Studio. Um, first of all, thanks for the innovation that you're doing and thank you for all the educators who are in this room right now. Uh, I don't think we could find a teacher that we could identify as not caring. Uh, we, we have good teachers, we have great teachers, and we have exhausted teachers. 
Um, also, I'd like you to talk about one of the many Achilles heels in the system, and that is school boards. In the city where I live, it's a racially divided school board, and it's an economically divided school board. These are the people who make all budgetary decisions, and um, they're, they're from the community, but most of them have no background in technology, education. Last week, I presented to um, a group of superintendents equivalent in Canada about open source and the opportunity to use open source curriculum to address some of the inequities and the costs. And it was a phenomenally scary presentation because half the people in there had no idea what I was talking about, even what open source was. They'd never heard of it, they didn't know with it. But when we got to the end of the session, they realized that there was an opportunity because this is an economic problem as well as an a knowledge problem. And they were, had all sorts of great ideas about how to bring this from the school board back into the schools. I think one of the fundamental problems has to do with the Please. bureaucracy around the way that education is organized right now. Um, nothing can get done when there's 35 children in a classroom. No matter, no matter how much technology we have or if the textbooks are free, 35 kids and one adult is just not an optimum learning situation. So I think that there's a national conversation that has yet to go on to reorganize public education. Mm -hmm. In some communities, the way that it's funded inherently makes it a failure. In some communities where things are racially divided or economically divided, there are families who opt out of the public system altogether. I work in a private school. You know. There are those options for those that have the means, but until there's a national conversation about reorganizing education and looking at the pedagogies that we use, especially in K-12, I don't think that some of these problems will get solved yet. Uh, question on the floor, and then we're gonna go to the screening room. So maybe a dangerous idea, if you look at Apache as an open source model that is being um, supported by IBM to sell the hardware, why is an open source being supported by computer vendors and broadband providers, now I don't have to pay for the books, and now people can pay money, or the school districts can use the money to buy the computers and buy the broadband that they don't have, so why isn't that a, a way of that's getting technology model. into the school? Into the and school that's that the economic model for Curriki. We think that to be a nonprofit, to continue to support open source, we need a sustainable model. And you have described one of the sustainable models. And we are talking to the computer vendors, we're talking to the broadband vendors, and we're talking to the publishers. And many people have asked me why, but you've defined the reasons why, because they need to support that, the, that they're not gonna go out of business if they don't print a book. They're gonna have to provide the support important services which schools will continue to pay for and they'll pay less and that schools can use the additional money to do the other things that need to be done. Well, there's a whole room full of HP people here, right? <laughs> New question. Hi, David in the dungeon. Um, <laughs> Hi, David. Hi, how are you? This is a question to, the, to everyone. I work in the UK very closely with the Department for Education. And the one thing, everyone, I applaud the open source that you're discussing here, I think it's fantastic. But as Peter just said, the one thing that strikes me with teachers is they're exhausted. I mean, we're talking about creating a whole new level of information here. And we're overwhelmed with information every day, especially teachers, about new courses, new curriculums. And the one thing I'd like you guys to maybe um, feed back to us is how do we take this information, distill it, and make sure that teachers aren't overwhelmed and that we present it in a way that they can actually use it? Well, I hope Kariki is going to help do that. We actually are working with the innovation unit in the Ministry of Education in the UK. My son, who's studying over there, told me, Mom, that was a non sequitur, education and innovation. But the, that being said, the British have decided to have a whole unit on innovation. And we're working with the innovation unit in the Ministry of Education there to provide their teachers with an open source course to learn how to integrate open source into their curriculum, along with their whole project in the UK called Next Best Practices. We're very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. On the floor, number one. I'd like to go back to Chris Lydon's question that was overlooked, and I think it's telling that it was overlooked about what's being left out. I think what we've heard is, is wonderful. It's really exciting to me, and I don't want to be unkind. But. Are you going but, to be anyway? Go ahead. Come on, Arthur. Who's go ahead, Arthur. Who's Come on. Come on, Arthur. But what, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, I, I am very much concerned. Technology has a way of focusing us, uh, focusing on what it can do. Technology can't help kids play instruments. Yes, they can synthesize sounds, but not play instruments. 
Technology can't give kids potter's wheels, can't, uh, can't help them, uh, you know, draw and paint and dance. And it's not an accident that I've listed all these artistic activities. And I worry that the very seductiveness and power and excitement and real value that we've heard leads us to forget what's not being done. How, how real do you think this fear is? And if you're not the force to countervail it because you're seeking support for what you're doing, where is that other support going to come from? I don't think it's going to come constructively from Luddites who want to devalue what you're doing. I don't think open source is technology. I'm, while that may be what we're talking about, I'm looking and Mark's done with his product. He's talking about getting the using the open source community to build that content and curriculum and print it on a book, give it to a teacher to teach dance or to teach art. So the open source community does not imply technology. What the open source community does is allow the community to collaborate to build the best of what's out there and not necessarily to deliver it on the computer. Technology uh, is just a tool. It's just a tool. Once you get over the sexiness of it, it's just a tool. But and it, maybe it, if we do something like what, what Bobby's still, doing. The question is still hanging. Yeah. For, first of all, when do, they, when do the kids read Middlemarch? And second when, to, to, th second, when do they learn their musical instrument? And third, maybe, where do they learn Socratic values? When do they learn doubt? When do they learn argument? But when, so, I mean, we can't answer that question. We can't tell you where it's going to fail because we would have addressed the issue if we could. So I mean, it's, it's very difficult. You, it needs to be adopted and used before we can find real problems. We've addressed every issue. We, I mean, between us, we all think about all the things that can go wrong and we try to address them. But you need to give credit where credit's due. Technology is an incredible tool in the classroom. If you go to a talk by Carl Wyman, um, a physicist who won the Nobel Prize, he's shown by splitting his, uh, his physics classes, undergrad physics classes, that the kids that they now know how to use computers, they enjoy it, so they use these um, FET uh, JavaScript applications to some of them build circuits on Java, in JavaScript apps and some of them build them in, in the real physical laboratory. And the ones who do it in JavaScript, they do better in the real lab at the end of the course because they're not scared to experiment. He, he, his example is that the kids arrive in the lab and they, they fixate on the colors of the wires when they're building their circuits, just as a simple example. But the ones that are building it in JavaScript, they're used to, they're used to playing games. They know you, there is a reset button. Life's not going to come to an end. So they really <laughs> just try. And then Mark, i gotta, I got to thank you and thank everybody and say the open source answer is we keep thinking about these things forever and find a way to, to say it somewhere, either on your blog or on our radio show, but keep talking about it. Mark, Kerry, Bobby, Andrew, David. All of you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.